Today's sermon is Shake Off the Dust, Every Christian's Mission. We're going to be turning back to Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. This is something of a parallel passage that I'm turning back to to remind you what Jesus said to his inner 12, his apostles, in sending them out. And then we're going to see how it relates to the passage we're primarily focusing on last Sunday in this, Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and following. Last week we read through verse 9. Today we're going to read all the way through verse 12. So here now God's word. First from Luke chapter 9. Then calling the 12 together, this is the 12 apostles. Their name means they're going to be sent. Finally, they're going to be sent after being named back in chapter 6. He, this means Jesus, gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. And whatever house you may enter, remain there. And from there, depart. In other words, leave the city from that first house you stay at. And as for those who do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony, as a witness, literally, against them. Then they went out and were going through the villages, preaching the good news and healing everywhere. Now to Luke chapter 10. Now after these things, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two before his face to every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out, to cast out, to throw out workers into his harvest. Go, behold, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the worker deserves his wages. Now, do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, Go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Shake off the dust, every Christian's mission. Do I have any Christians here among me today? Any, any Christians with me? Well, this is, your, this is your mission. This is your mission. We're going to be talking about that. And I'm going to take this with kind of two meanings, a little bit of double entendre, or two directions with shake off the dust. Number one, most obviously, Jesus is speaking about a witness towards his judgment against people who reject in groups and towns that reject the gospel. But then also, shake off the dust, we're also going to look at that from the idea of, you know, so back when I was a pastor, you know, I'm very ancient now, but when I was a young pastor, I would visit homes. I don't so much now, and I don't know what this means, but I, I, I used to visit church, uh, homes uh, of church members, and some of these homes of church members would have an old family Bible, like out in the parlor, where the moms didn't let the kids go and where, you know, nobody ever went except when the pastor or somebody like that came to visit them. Y'all kind of can get this scene here. And I would go and I would notice sometimes there was even dust building up on the family Bible because it was never used, right? So here's the thing. Some of us need to shake off the dust because we don't want to be like that old Bible stuck in the parlor and never doing anything with our faith. We want to serve the Lord, right? 
Okay, so uh, shake the dust off in that way too and move in the ministry. Speaking of moving around and visiting people, a couple of weeks ago, Bob Daniels and I and John Adamson from Second Presbyterian on behalf of our uh, presbytery served as a commission to go to First Presbyterian Church of Reform, Alabama, a church, a congregation that has just voted to leave the old mainline church, the PCUSA, and join the EPC. We went to examine, it's a small church, to examine the three members of session of, of that congregation, as well as the lay pastor who preaches, an uh, uh, older man, but that I've actually been mentoring the last few months. He's asked me to, his name is George McLaren. So we were there. I don't know, I've driven through Reform Alabama any number of times, and I can tell you when I drive through Reform Alabama, I religiously, I'm usually not a religious driver, I have to confess that, but I religiously keep my uh, uh, miles per hour at around 33 and 34 as I'm going through Reform, which has all these 35 uh, miles per hour speed notices on there because I've seen so many people be pulled over in that town. Some of you have too. Now, many of you, perhaps most of you, have not hung out in Reform a whole lot. It's not a place that I typically go to visit and hang out. I'm driving through Reform on the way to other places. Pardon me, but that's just the reality. But for the first time ever in my life, I spent half a day in Reform, Alabama, and the folks there at First Presbyterian Church are wonderful. And as we prepared to receive them, I told them, you know, once you get into our presbytery, and we're about to vote to approve it, and then the presbytery will also stamp this in, uh, you will probably be the most um, Presbyterian of all congregations in our presbytery because you are the first Presbyterian, get it, Church of Reform Alabama. If you don't know this, the Presbyterians are what's called Reformed Theology. So uh, I told him that, and George said, oh, well, you know about that name, where it came from. And he said, some itinerant preacher came through here a little over 100 years ago, and uh, our people were not very responsive. They were more, we had more bars and taverns than we had churches, and people were not responsive. And so uh, when he left, this itinerant preacher, some crazy preacher came, and he, uh, he literally shook the dust off of his shoes uh, against the town, as a witness against the town. But people called out at that moment and said, Pastor, what must we do? And he said, reform. And therefore, the people decided as they incorporated the township that they were going to be called Reform Alabama. Now, that got me thinking about who was this. And when I looked at the history, I realized you're not talking about 100 years ago. And then when I had to push George, and he said, well, maybe it was about the 1880s. No, 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 it's way before then. Okay, it's way before then. Uh, you're talking about a high-level, very famous pastor, Reverend Lorenzo Dow, also known as Crazy Dow one of the really fire and brimstone preachers of what's called the Second Great Awakening in the early 1800s of our young country, the United States of America. I, I found out in research that, no, 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 we're talking about Lorenzo Dow visited uh, Reform, what is now Reform, Alabama. It was just kind of a, a logging township with some saloons and, uh, you know, a bunch of Southerners uh, there uh, working in 1819 when he did his tour of West Alabama in 1819. Now, let me tell you, Lorenzo Dow was a unique preacher. Uh, he's unfortunately not still around, or I would invite him to come preach to you, and you'd probably really pay attention to him a lot more than you do to me when he preached. This guy was a wild man. It was famously said of him that neither a comb nor a brush ever encountered his hair or his beard. He was a gaunt man, a very committed, very fiery preacher. He had originally been a Methodist, but the Methodists kicked him out because he was too extreme for the Methodists, so he wasn't affiliated with any formal denomination or church. But he preached uh, in Scotland and Ireland and England in the early 1800s. He preached in the north, but where he received his worst reception, so to speak, was in the Deep South because he came into the Deep South and he preached against flagrant sin, you know, drunkenness, Southerners tend to get drunk a lot uh, on the weekends, being into their games and their sports more than they were God. He preached against racism and slavery. He was a, a very adamant abolitionist in the early 1800s. 
And uh, so when he came to reform, apparently uh, the folks did not respond much. They were drinking and you know partying on Saturday night instead of wanting to hear him preach on Saturday or Sunday. And so he shook the dust off of his boots uh, as he was prone to do with towns that were not receptive to, to the gospel. And the people did cry out and he famously told them you need to reform and so they said that's going to be our motto when we form a city here and now there are a number of churches in reform I, I have good news to tell you well that's actually pretty good for Lorenzo Dow compared to some other places he went famously uh, Lorenzo Dow went to what was old St. Stephen's in the territory of Alabama in the early 1800s and St. Stephen's was actually the capital of the territory of Alabama. And, and the people there totally rejected the gospel, did not reform, did not free their slaves, did not stop drinking and partying, and uh, did not receive the gospel. And so Dow expressed witness and judgment against them, shook the dust off of his boots, and said, this place within a generation that we know not one stone left upon another, and it will be a haunt of bats and wild beasts. And sure enough, through changes in the economy and some natural disasters that happen, if you go to old St. Stephen's, Alabama today, there's a monument marking it as the capital of the territory of Alabama, but nobody lives there anymore. So sure enough, sure enough, the curse of Lorenzo Dow apparently came to pass on uh, St. Stephen's Alabama. There is a newer St. Stephen's with about 120 people in it, but it's definitely not the capital of Alabama. And where these folks were actually is just dead now. But that's maybe even a less intense story than when Lorenzo Dow went to Jacksonboro, Georgia in the early 1800s. And when he went to Jacksonboro, the people there were not, the Southerners there were not only very resistant to the gospel, but they were getting drunk while he was, he actually went into some saloons and started evangelizing these folks, and they decided they were going to beat him up and hang him, and they did beat him up, and they took him out to hang him, but one man, one man who was a man of peace, remember how Jesus says, look for the man of peace, uh, one man who was a man of peace, Seaburn Goodall risked his life and stepped into the riotous mob and told them to lay their hands off of this man of God. Seaburn Goodall said, you, you, you're going to come under curse if you do this. And uh, Seaburn Goodall delivered uh, Lorenzo Dow into his own home, and he was able to stay there safe for the night. And the next morning, when uh, Lorenzo Dow was leaving the town, the hungover huge group of the citizens did not repent at that moment <laughs> and in and, and weeping and, and bowing before the Lord repent. Instead they were reviling Lorenzo Dow and making fun of him when he was riding out of town. And so Lorenzo Dow got off of his horse he shook the dust off of his boots against them and he said this town is under a curse and will not last. And sure enough, have any of you ever been to Jacksonboro, Georgia before? No, because it doesn't exist. Over the next several years, a number of mysterious fires burned down houses and saloons in Jacksonboro, Georgia. And pretty soon, people started saying, maybe that crazy preacher like, really was speaking the word of God. And like nice people who had families exited the town. The economy shifted. And if you go to Jacksonboro, Georgia today, the remains of it, there's nothing there except one dilapidated old white house that remains standing uh, through all of this. Guess what that house is? The home of Seaburn Goodall. I'm not making this up. This is actual American history. So, back to Jesus and what he teaches us. Let me be very clear. I'm not, now the Lord may do differently than this. The Lord can do whatever he wants to. I'm not telling you you need to be Lorenzo Dow. Let me make this very clear. I'm not saying our church needs to be Lorenzo Dow, uh, but we are called to be active as witnesses for Christ. So the Lord um, Jesus, he sent out his 12 apostles. And let me just tell you, I'll just kind of speed through this. The Greek there coming from the apostolo verb is uh, 
The apostles are called people who are sent out. That's actually their title. And so you could read chapter 9 of Luke. After chapter 6 of Luke, you've been waiting for Jesus to send these folks out. And it's like, well, yeah, Jesus. These are the inner core 12. You know, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Levi. Of course you're going to send them out. But that's kind of the, the high-level clergy people. This stuff doesn't apply to me, does it? And that's why it's so beautiful to come back to this point in uh, Luke chapter 10. Notice this. The Lord also, I mean, we're talking about additionally. This is separate from the 12. Okay? The Lord also appointed 72 others. You know the way the Luke, Luke, you see that. Luke uses the term specifically 72 others. In other words, other than the 12 inner apostolic witnesses. Jesus has been recruiting these disciples. Remember, Dean preached a couple weeks ago on three would-be disciples who said, well, I want to follow you, Jesus, but I don't really want to have to get involved in mission right now. I really don't want to get involved in this witness. And so they flamed out. But Jesus now has 72 who are actually willing to be his witnesses in the world. And see, what Jesus is saying is it's not just for the inner core clergy or not just for a person here and a person there who says, I'm called to be a missionary. Again, do we have any Christians among us? You raise your hand as a Christian, let me tell you, you are a missionary. By definition, you are sent in his mission. Jesus comes in mission and he sends his people. He saves you to be involved in his mission of the gospel and the kingdom to the world. So he sends out these other 72. And you notice the protocols for them and what they're authorized to do. They're authorized just to nitpick a little bit here. They have slightly less authority than the apostles, but they, basically, they can preach and heal, okay? And, and they're sent out. Now, let's take a step back and remember what the Great Commission is. The classic statement of the Great Commission is in Matthew chapter 28, and specifically verse 19. After Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, then he's going to delegate that authority in verse 19 what is the main verb and the command verb of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19? Parents teaching your children, you kind of want to know this. There's one main verb there. The other verbs that are translated like you think they're verbs, they're actually participial forms of verbs. The one main verb is mathe tusate. Okay? It means to make disciples. The main central command on which everything else hinges is make disciples. I'm going to dig into that and come back to that. Uh, let me just tell you to give a kind of a sense of this from the Mishnah from about 150 years before Jesus quoting uh, a, a teacher, Yosef ben Yotzer. Uh, the Mishnah records, this is early uh, Jewish rabbinic stuff from the time of Jesus. Let your house be a meeting place, your, home, your, your own home, be a meeting place for the wise. The Hebrew there is hakani, okay? And, and, and that means, that's kind of like a precursor title for what by the time of Jesus and after Jesus are called rabbis, teachers, okay? Like a wise teacher. Let your home be a meeting place for hakamim um, and powder yourself in the dust of their feet. In other words, sit under their teaching and then follow them out into the way. Okay, whatever they're, however they're teaching you to live. And drink their words with thirstiness. Now let's go back to this disciple thing, because that's really talking about what it means to be a disciple of a teacher. We're called to be disciples of the ultimate teacher, Jesus. So what does this mean, disciple? Um, Matheites is the Greek word for um, a disciple. Tamadim, by the way, would be the Hebrew. Well, what does this mean? It means learner. But for our purposes, and because disciple is kind of one of those church words that most people don't think about or understand very well, a lot of teachers now, folks who particularly focus on how we're called to be sanctified and spiritually formed as believers, are using the term nowadays apprentice. So we get the point. Okay, so if you're a disciple, you are an apprentice of Jesus. That's what Jesus has this following of apprentices. And let's go over the basics of apprenticeship learning. Apprenticeship learning is not just putting some data in a brain, right? For like to pull back for a test that you take on a piece of paper or on a computer. Uh, the way apprenticeship learning works is this. 
what I say, not only, the teacher says, not only believe, but also what? Learn to what? Say. So in other words, we don't just come to church and say, well, that was kind of nice. I can't remember anything that was said, but it kind of made me feel good and a little more faithful. But if I had to tell it to my neighbor or to my child or my grandchild, I kind of don't have anything that I can pull, you know? That's wrong. If we are missionaries, we by definition are also going to be learning more and more of the word and keeping the word so that we can convey the word to others. Okay? So if Jesus calls you to be a Christian, he's saying what I say, I don't just want you to say, oh, yeah, kind of intellectually, I believe it. I want you to take it in and be able to say it. Now you have to translate it. If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, I don't say Martin is the way, the truth, the life. I say Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. But I learn to say what he teaches me to say. And another aspect of this apprenticeship learning is the following. The teacher says, what I do, not only believe, but also learn to, come on, do. If I'm a, a, a apprenticing with a, a carpenter who repairs a door, I don't just say, I believe now that you can repair the door. That was very good, and I'll go home from church and feel really good about it. I'm actually supposed to learn to do what? Repair a door, right? Now, again, you've got to translate this because Jesus does things obviously uniquely as the Lamb of God and the atoning Savior of the world that I'm not going to do. But he calls me, as he goes to the cross, to, at my level, take up my cross, deny myself, and follow him. That's, that's apprenticeship learning. So I've talked about what the main verb of the Great Commission is, which is about making disciples, learners, apprentices. And then also, let me tell you about the first verb. It is a participle, and it literally means be going. Be going and make disciples, okay? So be going, notice this, we are supposed to go. We're supposed to be active. Last week I talked about the opening verses of this passage in Luke chapter 10. And if you missed that sermon or want to go back and listen, it supplements and, and pairs with the one today. It digs in much more intensely on the lambs among wolves and some early uh, verses in this passage. And we talked about the fact that Jesus' life, mission, and kingdom, by definition, if I'm a Christian, direct my life and my mission, and his kingdom is my kingdom. His kingdom values are my kingdom values. Go back and listen to lambs among wolves, and we talked about three things that we could uh, really uh, highlight from Luke chapter 10 verses 1 through 9. First in the urgency of it, the urgency of the mission. Remember Jesus says it's a harvest. You don't mess around with the harvest. You have a limited amount of time, otherwise the crop will go bad. When it's harvest time, you've got to be all in on the harvest. And Jesus says, in my mission, it's a harvest situation. I can't say, have you say, well, maybe when I retire, I could do some of this stuff. It's like, no, no, the harvest is now, Jesus is saying. You've got to get on to it. Work day and night in the harvest. So uh, all in urgency, understanding time is short, it's harvest time. Secondly, it needs to be prayer-based. Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to compel, to agbalo uh, workers out into the field. And remember this, Jesus then is the one who sends the workers. So Jesus is telling us, if you can connect the dots in reading the Bible, I am the Lord of the harvest, pray to me, and I send workers. It's a high proclamation of Jesus' divinity. Jesus sends, and he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send, and then he sends. Okay? And then third, uh, lamb-like. We're supposed to go lamb-like. Dependent, and that plays into a lot of these specifics that you just heard about, you know, not taking provisions, going poor, so that people have to make the choice. I talked about how this strategically confronts the world and individuals last week. What Jesus is doing is if somebody shows up in town and he needs to be taken in and fed, individuals and the town have to make a choice. Are we going to receive this person as a messenger of the Messiah and the kingdom or not? It forces their hand. They don't have provisions. You have to provide for them. So that's what Jesus is doing there. Now, today, let me continue with that theme and pull this back together with this message off the lamb-like emphasis. The mission is not about you. 
Your Christianity, Christian, should not be about you. God is going to provide for you. Believe me, you're his child, okay? But like Jesus says, seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. The mission is not about what I'm comfortable with or what I'm ready to do. It's about what he calls and inspires me to do. I'm not sure I'd be comfortable talking with that person about Jesus. It's not about me. Okay? It's not about my flesh and what I'm comfortable with. Likewise, I'm not supposed to be shopping around for a better situation. That's what Jesus is talking about when he talks to these folks, the, the disciples as well as uh, the larger group of disciples. Don't shop around for better digs. Like, in other words, if the poorest guy in town is the one who takes you into this house, but then the mayor hears you and says, hey, I kind of like your message. You can come over to my palace and hang out at my swimming pool, you don't say, great, I'm moving up in the world. You stay where you were first put with a person of peace. Okay? You're not shopping around. You're not looking for a better. And for us, that really applies to the way we live our lives. If God blesses us, we need to think in terms of, God, what do you want me to use this for your mission? As opposed to, wow, I can add on to my home and buy nicer stuff. <laughs> That's not the way a, a Christian mission person actually thinks. So Jesus calls us to travel light. I'm just going to summarize because I don't want to get in. Some of these weeds of these specifics are first century things that don't so much apply to us. But the basic idea is travel light through this life as a witness for Christ. Travel light. Don't burn yourself down with a lot of stuff. If you got a lot of stuff, consider giving some of it towards the mission. Okay. Uh, and transfer portal prohibited. I already just spoke about that. I'm sorry, college athletes, but according to Jesus, at least in the mission, the transfer portal is prohibited. I don't get to move up into the nicer house because somebody else invited me this week. Their food is better. No. Travel in pairs. Remember, this is not only for self, you know, group support, but also under the law, under Torah, twos are witnesses for the kingdom witnesses for the kingdom, and against those who reject the kingdom. That's Torah. That's under law. And then shake off the dust. Go as peace givers and peacemakers. You're not supposed to be Lorenzo Dow. Unless, hey, if you, if you think God is calling you to be that kind of guy or girl, we can talk about it later. We'll pray about it. But uh, before you go, we probably need to really pray about it. But in general, for most of us as Christians, we're not fire and brimstone people. We are gracious, uh, gentle, but clear and bold witnesses for Christ. So you got to shake off the dust. Go as peace givers, peacemakers. We are, as Paul says, ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. That's what it means when Jesus says, tell them the kingdom has come near, because Jesus hasn't come yet, right, to that town. What does that mean? We represent the kingdom as Christ's witnesses. The kingdom has come near, okay? Go as peace givers and peacemakers, but you must be witnesses against those in your own family, in your community, and on the mission field, wherever that is, out in the community, of people who reject Christ and his kingdom. It, it's just a reality of who you are as a Christian. So Jesus calls us to shake off the dust in witness against those who reject the king and his kingdom. Shake off the dust, he says, in nine to the apostles again in chapter 10 even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you he tells his disciples to say to the townspeople nevertheless know this the kingdom of god has come near this is an echo of ezekiel when god calls ezekiel and says as for them whether they listen or not in other words uh, judah the house of judah in jerusalem for they are a rebellious house they will know that a prophet has been among them. So Jesus is echoing Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 5 there with his instructions. So here's the thing. What do we do when people reject us as Christians and the gospel? We don't get mad. Okay? We don't get angry, not in the flesh. We just know it's a reality and a reality of witness. We still pray for them. We still try to be gracious. But at a certain point, the Lord is saying, you've got to allocate your time well, okay? And you are a witness by definition. Therefore, know this, that the Lord's judgment is and will be far worse for, in this case, Jews, 
When these Jewish disciples are shaking off the dust, that's what you did when you came out of pagan Gentile territory back into the Holy Land. A Jew was supposed to shake off the dust from the pagan idolatry and not besmirch the Holy Land. And what Jesus is telling these witnesses, his disciples, is you are telling these people they're not true Israelites. Okay, I just went deep there without telling you that's what's going on here. Jesus is saying you are a witness against them. They're not true Israel. These Jews are not true Israel. But understand this, too. There are church folk and people who are on the rolls of churches who also have the same witness against them. Because the truth is, they claim to be Christians, but they are not receiving the kingdom and the mission of the kingdom. And you're going to have that. You might have that in your own family with various people in your family. Claim to be Christian, but the truth is they are not on fire in the Holy Spirit for the Lord. They're not giving their lives away for the mission of the kingdom. And you are, whether you like it or not, a witness in that process. You don't bring the judgment. God does. You give an opportunity for repentance off of the witness. But at a certain point, you've got to shake the dust off and move on to people who are actually open to the kingdom. Okay? You've got to allocate and prioritize your time well. So when your witness is rejected, trust the Lord's blessings for you and ultimately for anyone who will repent and turn to him. Be resilient and resolved and move ahead with the mission. Shake the dust off, right? But the negative part of that and the positive part of that. And Jesus says, blessed are you when people will hate you, exclude you, revile you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers treated the prophets just the same. So apprentices, shake off the dust and go. And Jesus says this, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, you get this apprentice connection here? As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. John 20, verse 21. We're sent. If you're a Christian, you are sent by Jesus out as a witness into the world. You're a missionary. As the Father in his gracious love sent the Son to the world, for God so loved the world, in a follow-up way, Jesus sends us, not to save the world, but to share his saving gospel and his kingdom with others. As Jesus says, you are the light of the world. David Bosch, the great missiologist, says this. This is stirring. The church is the only society in the world that exists for the sake of those who are not members of it. The only society in the world that exists for folks who are not members of it. That's who we are as Christians in the church. We're for other people, just like Jesus gave himself for the broken world to which he came. Remember, this mission is not about you. God will take care of you, but it's not about you. It's about the kingdom mission that he's sending you to fulfill. Bosch again says this, mission is the good news of God's love incarnated in the witness of a community. In other words, us together as the church, they will know you are Christians by your love, Jesus says. The powerful love of a strong witness. And then know this, be assured, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Believe it, trust him, and go. He's sending us as a witness of the gospel and the kingdom to a broken world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.